Amen. It is truly the name of Jesus that makes the darkness tremble. I love that song. Well, if you do not know who I am, my name is Pastor Austin, and I serve here as the worship pastor. So normally I would be up here with the team, leading, helping lead you in worship, and it's one of my greatest joys in life. But today I get the honor and privilege of being able to share the word of God with you as we continue in Revelation. But before we get to that, I have a question. How many of us can relate to ever uncovering something that we were disappointed by? Anyone? Of course, it's all. That applies to us all. <laughs> and today I have a few examples of, a thing, of things that I think we all truly can relate to that we have uncovered or it's been revealed to us. And it is not what we were planning it to be. So, picture one. We have a picture of Amazon boxes. And you know, you may find that time when a box arrives to your door, whether it is a video game that your parents have ordered for you, whether it's a book, whether it's equipment, or something you really need for school like me, and you order it last minute, and you end up uncovering that box and realizing that what you ordered is not in there, and you end up like this guy. So in case you can't read it, it says, bought a rug online for my room and realized, definitely not even spelled right, the importance of specifying the size of the product you are selling. So no one likes to be in that position. Number two, and this one hits really close to home for me because I like to eat. Y'all know where I'm from. I said I'm not going to mention it today. You may not know. You'll have to ask someone else. Now, I do not like McDonald's, but I love to eat like many of us. And there is nothing like going through a drive through of a fast food restaurant and you give your order to the person on the intercom and sometimes repeat yourself because they cannot hear you. And then you get up to the drive through window. You get your bag and you uncover it. And what happens? You realize it is not what you ordered. And don't let it be a day when you're in a rush because you know you cannot take it back. And that hurts deeply for me. <laughs> and then this last one we have is gender reveal. This is a common thing within our society where usually we will help celebrate our favorite couple or a couple we like as they're getting ready to have a baby. Now, I don't have any special videos of a gender reveal, because I figure, why don't we pretend like we're having one today here at Crossroads? So, that's what we're gonna do. Crossroads, you all are having a baby. <laughs> and it is your job to guess whether it's a girl or a boy, and I will reveal it to you in this package with either a pink slip with um, lipstick or a blue slip with a mustache. We'll go with that. All right, who's team girl? Come on, this is the part where you can be loud, kids too. Team girl? All right, who's team boy? Yes, sir, that's where it's at. All right, Crossroads, you are having a boy and a girl. We're having twins. Oh, I love it, I love it. Hey. It doesn't get no better than that. No, I'm not giving any information to my personal life. That is no secret to anything. <laughs> anyway, but as we're in Revelation today, I want to remind us that Revelation is tied to the word apocalypse, which this word means in Greek, an uncovering or a revealing. So today, the point of talking about Revelation is not just to talk about the end, all this bad stuff is happening. It's rather to point to the great reveal of Christ and his church being re reunited with him. So before we get into Revelation 14, our text for the day, I have to review a little bit of Revelation 13. Last week, Pastor Nan talked about Revelation 13. In this chapter, we see that the beasts, there are two beasts who try to steal God's worship and are even allowed to ha wreak havoc on the earth for a certain period of time for anyone who does not accept this dreadful mark of 666, which is the mark of the beast and represents evil and wickedness. And this is a time that is not good for the believer because the Bible even says that they will go through persecution. 
So the beast is going to have its great day, but there's hope. Revelation 14 reminds us that the Lamb or Christ will have his day where he will be reunited fully with his church. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And we're also going to talk about some warnings that are given within the chapter. So we're going to get ready to read. And yes, I know some of you who have been here are thinking, oh, my gosh. I said, gosh, just so you know, there is another passage of reading, long passage of reading. Here's what I'm going to do today. I'm breaking some of it up into three sections, hopefully to help us understand it a little bit. But I ask that you join me. We're going to walk through this together. So I invite you to stand as we read the word of the Lord in Revelation 14. All right. Section 1, 14, 1 through 5. It says this. Then I looked and there before me was the lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him, 144,000 who had his name and had his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud pedal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a song before the throne and before the living, four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000. That's key. Who had, been redeemed from, who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They followed the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God in the lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. That's section one. Now we're going to go to section two, Revelation 6 through 12. It says, then I saw another angel flying in midair, John says, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink from the maddening wine of her adulteries. Then there's a third angel that says, a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its, marks, its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured out full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Then verse 13 says this. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. And now we come to our final section, section 3, verses 14 through 20. It says, I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud. Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he was seated on the cloud, swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. And another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. He says, take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes and threw them into a great wine press of God's wrath. They were trampled in the wine press outside the city and the blood flowed out of the press rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So that's a lot to digest, right? A whole lot. I've even been reading it this week. I'm like, ah, that's so much and so intense. So let's break this down. 
So, section one, Revelation 14, one through five. The scene has changed. In this part of Revelation, John sees a vision where the lamb will have its day and he's sitting on Zion, which is believed to represent Jerusalem, the holy city here. And there are 144,000 who have the name of Jesus or the name of the lamb and the father on their heads. Now, who are these 144,000? If you look back at Revelation chapter 7, it mentions the 144,000. And this number builds off the number 12. And we see in chapter 7 that the 12 tribes of Israel are represented in a very large way and equal the 144,000. So, I hope some of us are good at math. Let's try at least calculate this generally to see how we got there. So what's 12 times 12? Okay, I think most of us got it. It was 144 times 1,000. All right, good. I, don't, I didn't hear any bad answers. Okay, we still got math going on. I'm with it. So 144,000. This represents the abundance of God's people. The, name is, the number is not necessarily as much literal as it is metaphorical in talking about the full abundance of those who have been persecuted and have endured trial and those who have been faithful to Christ and are restored back to him. And it says they have the name of Jesus or the Lamb and the Father on their head, branded on their head. And this name is to be believed to be Yahweh, which for Bible scholars, you may know that the name Yahweh that is meant for God is mentioned 6,800 times in the Old Testament, and it carries to the New Testament. It refers to God as being the eternal one who has no rival. And what does branding represent? It usually represents allegiance, like even today in our own society. We have different brands that we all like, whether it's Nike, whether it's Apple, or I hate to say it, Android, and those people who have green messages that really bother me when I text them. And these brands re usually represent loyalty to something that we trust. So these believers having the name Yahweh branded on their head are saying they are loyal and have allegiance to the kingdom of God and not to the kingdom of darkness accepting the Mark 666. What else does it say about these believers? So there's a weird kind of verse in here that talks and says that these are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remain virgins. So this may sound a little misogynistic, but I tell you, that is not what is necessarily believed as being the literal meaning of this verse. So in general, we take from that verse that it actually is referring to believers in general, all believers, who do not fall to the pagan world system, do not fall to idolatry and wickedness and sexual perversion, but are faithful to the Lord. These are those who are blameless who will be redeemed. And not only that, it also mentions how they are the first fruits. First fruits are usually, when it comes to agriculture, harvest that is given first. And even the people of God in Exodus 23 were commanded to give the best of their first fruits. So these are those who have devoted themselves once again to Christ. And what I love the most about the end of this section is that it talks about how they can sing a song that nobody else can sing. It's reserved for them. And the reason I believe that this song is reserved for them because I believe there is only a certain song and only a certain encounter people can have with God after going through a certain amount of persecution and trial. I believe it reveals to us who God is and reveals to the believers who God is in a way that nobody else can fully grasp. So that's why I believe they can sing a song that no one else can sing. And the beauty of it is that in Zephaniah 3.17, it even talks about how Israel will be restored. And God says he sings, he rejoices over his people with singing. So we get to return that glory back to him yet again. Now we move to section two. Here we go. This section, we got the three angels. So stay with me. These three angels all have a different call that they are making. So angel number one, what do we have? This angel is seen flying in midair, giving a final appeal for people to come Christ. And this representation of him flying in midair is seen as the universality of the message, meaning that this message is for everyone on earth. It is a call for everyone on earth to come and worship God. 
And we see that the angel specifically says this in the verse. Verse 7 says, he said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So more than it just being like the good news we see, that Jesus Christ has come to save the world, we see it as a call to give a final chance to those who have not accepted Christ and have chosen, have not chosen to worship him fully. Now, when we look in the New Testament, the word worship in Greek means proskuneo. And that re specifically refers to or means to kiss or to lay prostrate on your face. I'm not going to do that today, but in loyalty or reverence to usually a deity or a king. So it's truly emphasizing to come and worship the king of kings, devote your life to him, show honor and reverence with your submission. And you know, one of the things that I really enjoy about scripture and about God is that he doesn't give us a reason to, he doesn't tell us to worship him without giving us a reason why. At the end of the scripture, it said, worship the one who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. It is saying worship the creator, the one who has created us, the one who has created everything, the one who knows us inside and out, the secrets that people don't know, the things that make us tick, the things that we can't figure out about ourselves. Come and worship the one who is the reason why you are. And then we move on to the second angel now. This second angel represents that the kingdom of darkness has fallen. The angel says this, it says, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. So we call this prophetic perfect tense, this form of speaking, which basically means you're saying something is happening as if it's already happened, but it has yet to happen. And what does Babylon represent? Babylon is a city that we see mentioned constantly in the Old Testament. And this city is connected to Rome or has ties with Rome by the fact of being a city that is known for wickedness, sexual perversion, and complete rebellion against God. So what is being said here is that the kingdom of darkness is going to have its day and it will not have the final say. The kingdom of God will. And then we go to the third angel. And there's a lot of imagery in this one. And this third angel gives the consequence for those who accept the mark of the beast, the 666. And also it's a warning to believers to not accept it. In this, in this part of the chapter, we see it said that God will pour out his wrath and the wine of his fury will be in full strength, verse 9 says. And it not only says that, but it says that those who accept this mark will be tormented with burning sulfur and the smoke will rise forever and ever. So let's look a little bit back in history as we dissect this. So wine. So historically, ancient Greeks Greeks would dilute wine to a one to three ratio. And they would do this because it would usually improve the quality or taste. And if you were a person who just drank wine right as it was, it was considered kind of barbaric. So we see God saying here that he is going to pour out his wrath in full strength using the representation of wine. It's not gonna be diluted. And then it mentions burning sulfur. Burning sulfur is something we also see in the Old Testament in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, a wicked city that was destroyed. Burning sulfur is a weapon of war. And it's saying that those who accept this mark will be tormented constantly. Now, I don't believe that this is necessarily um, literal as much as it is metaphorical that this torment will be psychological, that it will be spiritual. And we see here that at this point, God's judgment is final. There is no chance for redemption, but is officially full separation from Christ. 
And this is what God tells his believers. He reminds them or calls them to yet patiently endure all the trial they face and to obey him and to not receive this mark. And the scripture then goes on to this section that doesn't even really fall into part two or three. It's just verse 13. You see a random beatitude or blessing that is mentioned in Revelation. And it says this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. So the Apostle John, who's communicating these visions of these angels, is helping believers to recognize that, hey, being faithful to Christ, things may get worse. And some people may lose their life or be persecuted for it. And looking at this verse, in the midst of all of this, I see God's kindness. Now, I know that sounds weird. We just heard all this treacherous stuff that will happen. But I believe God is so kind, in the matter of fact, like a good father, when he warns us of what's to come because he does not want us to face that and calls out to us and says, I have something better for you. That's what a good father does. And I love that Romans 2, 4 says this. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Talking to the Christians in Rome. Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? He's a kind, kind God. Now we go to our final section. Section three, Revelation 14 through 20, and it is harvest time. So here we see two different analogies of gathering harvest. The first one, we have two individuals. We have an angel who is calling out to one who is said to be like the son of man. And this angel is telling him that it is that the harvest of the earth is ripe and ready. And it's time to come and reap. Now, what does this mean when we say someone like a son of man? Various scholars and people have differences on who they think this person is and what it represents, whether it's an angel or whoever. But what I believe we can take this understanding as being as being as Christ coming to get his church and his believers who have been faithful to reconcile and fully reunite them with him. And then it mentions that a sickle will be used to do this, um, to reap. Now, many of you may know what a sickle is. I'll be honest. I read this text and I didn't know. I am a city suburban guy. I did not grow up around farms. I don't know nothing about it. Tractors, I barely can tell you what a windmill is. So, <laughs> in case you're like me, this is what a sickle looks like. And in our natural world, it is what is used for reaping. So we're seeing this metaphor analogy that is showing us of a reaping of God's people. Then there's the second analogy that shows us a contrast. And it demonstrates two specific angels. And there's one angel that is calling to another coming from a temple. And it also says, it's time to reap. So bring your sickle. And it specifically talks about grapes being ready to be reaped. And one angel tells the other to go and take the grapes and to throw them into a wine press to be crushed. And it says this, which is pretty rough at the end. It says, once they are put in the wine press of God's wrath, It says, blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. And on the screen, you see a picture of a wine press. Historically, a wine press was used to crush grapes. So this is not anything new. But also, every reference to the Old Testament, even to Joel 3.13, 
the prophet Joel, we see the mentioning of grapes being crushed. And this usually represents God's wrath against those who have unfortunately chosen the kingdom of darkness and have not chosen God himself. That's hard for those who haven't accepted the call. But here we see godly justice. We see the excitement for the believer that one day he will fully take us to be reunited with him and it will be revealed to us fully who he is. And yes, those who do not accept him will deal with his great wrath. But I want to remind us that God loves his creation. It's just his holiness and his being that doesn't allow him to accept sin. So what do we do with all of this today? Well, I have a couple of takeaways for us. And the first one I have is for is repent. Now, I know this is something we have heard time after time after time this week, after each and every week. But I want us to walk this back a little bit, because a lot of times I think we say repent. But from what? And here's the thing. Let me make this clear. Repentance is not just for that first time you ex choose to accept Christ as your personal savior, as we call it, or to worship him with your whole life, as the scripture talked about. Repentance is not just for the unbeliever, it is for the believer. It is something that we constantly need to do because sometimes we are the ones who get off track in our journey with God and sometimes we cannot even see that we've gotten off track. So, I think we need to do some self-examination when it comes to this. I remember growing up in church as like a teenager. And I remember at that time, I really, really wanted to know God and be like God. And I remember a pastor saying, do you want to be like God? He was saying to the entire congregation. And I remember my heart jumped. I got so excited. I was like, yes, yes. And he said this, if you want to be like God, then pray a hard prayer. He said, ask God, Lord, Reveal anything in me that is unlike you. And I remember sitting there, and I was like, oh, I don't like this gospel. <laughs> because I realized that I could no longer focus on everybody else and what they weren't doing right and how they're doing this and that wrong. And I realized, oh, the mirror has to turn this way. So today, that's one of the things I want to encourage you all to do throughout this week. Take some time and ask the Lord, honestly, and be real. Lord, reveal the things in me that are unlike you and don't line up with you. And be open. Be open to how God wants to show those things to you. He may show it through your friends and your family, the people that you may be tired of hearing from. Let's humble ourselves because he may be using them to speak to you. He may speak through you or speak to you through his word as you're reading scripture. And I believe God's always speaking through his word, but there may be something particular that is pointed out this week. Be open to it. It may come through your time of prayer, whatever it may be. I once again say, be open to God pointing out things because he desires to change us. Next, and this is my second point and my final point, which is to endure. And what you see up on the screen is an important reminder I think we all need that our feelings cannot be the foundation for our faith. And I believe for some of us in this room, it's hard right now. It's really hard. 
right now. It seems like the more we trust God, the worse things get. Some of us as parents have found that we have been praying for our kids to be saved over and over, and it seems like some of them are just spiraling out of control. Some of us are facing trial after trial. We have gone through grief. We have gone through loss. We are mentally struggling and feel like we may be on the brink of losing our minds. Some of us have an addiction, and this could be a plethora of things that we've been trying to conquer, but it seems like we just can't get over it. And I believe some of us in this room are thinking that we just want to throw in the towel at this point and turn away from God completely because it's just too much. And the things of this world may even become enticing to us. We may find that we want to give into greed and letting money corrupt us, the love of money corrupt us. We may want to give into sexual relationships that we have no business being in. We may be tempted to be unfaithful in our marriages. Or some of us may even want to be vengeful and make sure we can finally get each and every person back who has hurt us so deeply. I want to give you this reminder today because I know what it's like to be in that place, that place where you just want to give in. And it's not anything super crazy I got for you. It's a scripture. And one we commonly hear, which is Romans 8, 28. That God works all things together. He works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I have to let that sit for myself a little bit and remind myself that today. And I want to remind you that he's working things for your good. It may not seem like it. It may not feel like it. But I say to you yet again, our feelings cannot be the foundation for our faith. Yes, sometimes it will not feel good. And it doesn't mean that we can't embrace the matter of fact that we have feelings, but it cannot be the foundation and be the thing that guides us in this walk with God. And here's the thing I also want to encourage you in. Remember the persecution we talked about of the believers? Yes, there's some persecution and trial for us to face even in the here and now. But I want to remind you that there are small victories that we can see as we choose to endure and to hold on to Jesus Christ. And we can have hope in those victories until the greatest day of all. On that triumphant day when the Lamb has his day. And we get to see him face to face and where all the pain is gone. And this last thing I want you all to know, it's bigger than us. It is truly bigger than us. Our life is a testimony. And this is what it does. Our life reveals who Christ is to others and is a compelling call to the world to follow Today we're going to close singing a song that has been sung for decades in the church. And this song in particular is Be Thou My Vision. It's a hymn. And I know for some of us, it may be like, oh my gosh, these old songs. But I think that they hold weight and value. And I want to break it down just a little bit for the, some of us who are younger and like, what is thou and thy and this and that. Usually the word thou or thy means you. So when we say the words, be thou my vision, we say, Lord, may you be my vision, may you be my focus. When we say, be thou my wisdom, we say, Lord, you be my wisdom. You be my ultimate source for wisdom. 
So I now invite you to stand as we sing this today. And may this be our prayer for God to be our vision and our focus.